Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Institute of Health and Wellbeing 2020 Morris Block Annual Lecture and Seminar. Um, I'm Rod Taylor, uh, Professor of Population Health Research based at SPHSU and the Robertson uh, uh, Institute for uh, Biostatistics. And it's my great pleasure to chair this year's lecture. Before I introduce our esteemed speakers uh, and this year's lecturer, for those of you who include myself, who are relatively new to the Institute, I thought I would say a few brief words about the history of this lecture. Sir Maurice Block was born in Dundee in the late 1800s and settled in Glasgow in 1910, where he founded his family distilling business, which he then sold in the 1950s and set up a trust that included a generous gift to the University of Glasgow to endow this lecture that now bears his name on some aspect of medical science or practice and medical research fellowship. So to this year's lecturer, Professor Jeanette Ikovix is currently Dean of Faculty at Yale NUS College in Singapore and the inaugural Samuel and Lieselette Herman Professor of Social and Behavioral Sciences at Yale School of Public Health, as well as Professor of Psychology at the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Yale University. As we're about to hear, Professor Ikovix is perhaps best known for her research in group perinatal care, where her where her research and policy contributions have been and continue to be substantive. She has expertise in running large, scientifically rigorous clinical trials in the community setting and has been funded by to the tune of more than 40 million US dollars from various grants, including the National Institute for Health and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She is author of more than 200 peer review publications and a recipient of our honours and awards that include the recent election as Fellow of the Academy of Behavioural Medicine Research and the Strickland Daniel Mentoring Award from the American Psychological Association. We've got a slightly different lecture format this year, so I'm also delighted to welcome Professor. Fraser Burrell. Fraser is Director of Science and Research for the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine, Faculty of Medical Science at the University of Newcastle. And I'm delighted to say that Fraser has act, agreed to act as a discussant and talk about his extensive experience of embedding group care models across the NHS. So, in terms of our format, what we'll do this year is we'll have a 40 minute presentation from our Morris Block lecturer. Um, then we'll directly go into five minutes discussion from our discussant. And then if that all goes to plan, that should hopefully leave five to 10 minutes for the opportunity for Q and A uh, with our two speakers. So I would very much like to encourage the audience to submit your type questions through the Q&A function to our two speakers. Um, please uh, perhaps refrain from using the chat. We'll use the chat for technical issues. Um, and if all goes to plan, that should leave us uh, five to 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. And I will make sure that we, we, we complete at 11 o'clock sharp. Jeanette, under more normal circumstances, you would be with us here in Glasgow, where we would have been able to extend to you some of our famous Scottish hospitality that I am sure would have included a convivial dinner speaker, uh, speaker's dinner, I should say. While sadly, we don't have that pleasure, that doesn't diminish in any way my huge personal pleasure in thanking you for accepting this invitation as our Morris Block lecturer this year. We very much look forward to hearing your presentation and the Zoom presentation floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Taylor. And I, I hope I can take a rain check on the visit to, to Glasgow. 
So let's see. My slides are not yet advancing. Apologies. There we go. Each year, 140 million babies are born in the world, more than 11 million per month, nearly 400,000 per day, and more than 16,000 per hour. And so since the top of the hour, about 1,500 babies have just been born in the world. And the vast majority are healthy, and so it's a joyous time for most families. Good prenatal care is one of the most important things that contributes to a healthy pregnancy and salutogenic outcomes for both mother and baby. My objectives today are to describe our program of research on group prenatal care, which was developed to improve care and health outcomes, including evidence from two randomized controlled trials plus translational research. And I'll present some of uh, the evidence of group prenatal care for outcomes related to preterm birth and other infant outcomes, maternal weight trajectories and mental health and cost. And then toward the end, I'll articulate opportunities for future research and implementation, including issues around uh, what are the mechanisms for the effects that we see, some of the challenges and solutions, and also scale up. Now, before I get to these specific aims and to describe even group prenatal care, I want to make two historical notes and connections to you at the University of Glasgow, um, perhaps as, as Professor Taylor said, all the more important since I'm not uh, able to be there with you. Um, as we heard from Dr. Taylor, so Maurice Block established the Block Trust in 1956. And this was to advance religion and education for the cure and alleviation of sickness and disease. And I hope that this lecture is synchronous with Mr. Block's priorities insofar as group prenatal care is indeed an opportunity to quote, address medicine in relation to the community. And as such, I'm really honored to deliver the Maurice Block lecture today. Two Years after the Block Trust was established, another connection to you in Glasgow is that Dr. Ian Donald, who was then the Regis Professor of Midwifery, and his colleagues published these very first fetal ultrasound images in The Lancet. And although these were rather crude initial images, they laid the foundation for further development in sonography that is used routinely to identify fetal anomalies and to establish gestational age. That is um, the start of the pregnancy and the expected due date. And it's a very important tool in the context of prenatal care in order to establish when births are carried to full term or whether they are preterm, that is um, born too soon. Preterm birth is defined as a live birth that occurs before 37 completed weeks of pregnancy. And despite great biomedical advances over years and decades and, and centuries, preterm births still represent more than one in 10 of every birth. And that equates to 15 million per year globally. Moreover, Preterm birth is the leading cause of death among children younger than age five, with one million deaths per year. And I want to mention that these rates have been rising in nearly every country, though of course there are geographic variations with highest rates in low income countries, as well as the United States. Preterm birth is very important because it affects every organ in the body. And illustrated here, just a few of the short-term outcomes related to the brain, the eyes, the gut, lungs, and skin. There are also very uh, many long-term uh, adverse effects of preterm birth, ranging from the physical to the neurodevelopmental, psychological, and behavioral, 
and economic and societal. And I won't go through all of the detail here, but you can see them on the screen. What I'd like to do is, is highlight uh, the proverbial bottom line, and that is that preterm birth impacts health across the lifespan. Uh, it's true that many preterm babies grow up to be healthy children, adolescents, and adults, but it is also true that preterm birth is a predictor for long-term chronic mental and physical illness. In a very important paper published a few years ago by Ferrero and colleagues um, in PLOS One, the, the highlighted point here in the title is that despite this huge number, right, 15 million preterm births and a million deaths, associated, there's no biological explanation for two thirds of all preterm births. In other words, it's idiopathic, uh, no known cause. Now, despite the fact that we don't always understand the cause of preterm birth, there are clinical interventions that we can use to decrease the risk. And here are nine of them as highlighted by the March of Dimes uh, a few years ago. And they begin with smoking cessation and eliminating early elective deliveries or reducing higher order multiple gestations when using, for instance, in vitro fertilization. And I want to highlight um, number four here, progesterone supplementation. This is a, a very um, typical clinical intervention to decrease preterm birth. However, it's only used uh, to reduce preterm birth recurrence. And so it's not typically used with a first pregnancy or when there has been no prior documented preterm birth. And among the other interventions that the March of Dimes uh, notes is the use of group prenatal care. So what is group prenatal care? Uh, group prenatal care provides continuity of care to eight to 12 pregnant women with similar estimated due dates. So for example, we would take all women with a due date um, of August and put them in a group together. In this way, they share timing with regard to physiological, psychological, and social aspects of pregnancy. And we provide all care in a group setting um, and, and the components of care are the same as you would get in individual traditional care. They include risk assessment and labs, they include health promotion and patient education, and they inc include medical psychosocial assessment, intervention, and follow-up. Now I should say a first visit upon intake to prenatal care, as, as you uh, in the UK often call antenatal care, is done privately, that would be uh, intake and history, uh, and initial physical, and also toward the end of pregnancy when there is the need for cervical checks. But otherwise, uh, belly checks, um, uh, blood pressure checks, and all of the other components of care are provided in a group setting. So a bit more on our clinical approach. Why group prenatal care? Or why care in a group at all? And we believe that First and foremost, learning and social support are enhanced by group settings. Uh, we are in a virtual group right now. Uh, we teach in groups and classes uh, because we believe in the power of group. Now, it's important to recognize that group medical care, group prenatal care or in other settings is not a classroom. It is a place though where we share education or information, skills development, we also use it for attitude change and motivation. And I think one thing that's really quite special, especially when you have been to a lot of group uh, care as I have, is to see the enhanced insight that is garnered through the sharing of common life experiences. Another important thing from a behavioral change perspective is that we, really see quite actively that new community norms are generated for health enhancing behaviors. And um, for example, uh, what it means to have a healthy pregnancy. Uh, so, you know, uh, no smoking or substance use during pregnancy, um, you know, really tending to your nutrition, your physical activity, your sleep and so on. Uh, a second 
important component to our clinical approach is that this is integrated care to meet the complex needs across the perinatal period. I already mentioned things like nutrition and physical activity, mental health, having a safe pregnancy. Uh, we also completely integrate uh, readiness for labor and delivery. And we talk and train for breastfeeding and early infant care and safety. And so in a sense, it's, it's one-stop shopping. It's you know everything you need in, in one place at one time. And third, I want to highlight that this provides more time with your healthcare provider. So each group visit is actually two hours long and the visits are scheduled across the pregnancy. So we typically have two hours by 10 prenatal care appointments, which is 20 hours of prenatal care. In the United States, a typical prenatal care visit would be 10 to 15 minutes. And so a typical traditional individual care would be about two to three hours of care compared to the 20 hours that we can provide in the group setting. And this also leads to greater efficiency uh, by having a group of eight or 10 women together. And Professor Burrell will talk a bit about this uh, later in the hour as well. So if they say a picture's worth a thousand words, um, this is one image of what prenatal care, group prenatal care looks like. And you can see it, it doesn't look anything like a doctor or a midwife and a patient in a room, in a closed room. Here we see a group of patients, of pregnant women, um, perhaps with some support personnel. And in this particular slide, you see uh, Sharon Rising sort of kneeling in the center with, with two patients. And what they're doing is actually uh, the skills development and training, in this case, for how to relieve low back pain. And um, when I was pregnant uh, with my children 20 years ago, um, I was handed a piece of paper with stick figures drawn saying, oh, if you have low back pain, you know, try to, here are some exercises to do. So what group care provides is this opportunity, as I said, for education and skills training in a very active and engaged way. And today I'm gonna to talk about, I'm gonna present results to you from some slightly different models of group prenatal care, ranging from centering pregnancy, which Sharon Rising um, uh, developed, but which my team along with Sharon and those from the Centering Healthcare Institute uh, actually standardized and systematized the um, curricula. And we also had an enhanced model of Centering Pregnancy that we called Centering Pregnancy Plus, which had a big HIV prevention component and, re and also promotion of reproductive um, health. And you'll hear me talk about some of those findings. And then a more recent uh, permutation of group care called Expect With Me that combined high touch and high tech. And we developed a wonderful um, IT platform for both patients and for providers and health systems. And because of our time today, I'm not gonna differentiate, but I did wanna start out by saying, we'll be talking, I'll be talking about some different models of group care. And there are others as well, um, uh, including pregnancy circles in the UK and other uh, individual mo other models of group care that, that um, various research and clinical groups have developed. Now, I don't have time today to talk about the theoretical underpinnings, but I wanted to just share this image from a paper that my colleagues and I published a couple of years ago in the American Psychologist that really highlighted the transdisciplinary nature of our work and, um, and illustrated the ecological systems theory as the underpinning, the theoretical underpinning for group prenatal care. And you can see from the concentric circles that the both the clinical care and the research models were designed to focus on the individual level, the interpersonal level, the institutional, and the community and societal level. And I'll highlight in particular at the interpersonal level, the family and peer relationships, and at the institutional level, the importance of prenatal care uh, in relation to um, healthcare access, utilization, and cost, some of the things we'll talk about today. On the right side, you'll see improved outcomes, and I, of course, will we'll provide some of the evidence for this uh, throughout the rest of the hour. 
So I go from that sort of bulleted list to this illustrated list. And these are some of the many positive outcomes that, that our research team, but also others around the world, have documented as a result of group prenatal care. So starting on the top on the left, we see the effects uh, related to preterm birth and birth weight. And um, I mentioned why, uh, why these are very important at the, at the start of my talk. And in just a moment, I'll show you some data here. Group prenatal care also has impacted healthcare utilization with reductions in emergency department use and both admission to and length of stay in the neonatal intensive care unit, which I'll sometimes refer to as NICU use uh, as we go along. And of course, these have great implications for cost. Uh, then we also have implications postpartum for breastfeeding, increases in breastfeeding. We've got implications for um, the, the weight trajectory during and after pregnancy. I'll present some data on this in a moment. We have some reproductive health outcomes, as I mentioned, for a reduction in sexually transmitted diseases, specifically chlamydia and gonorrhea uh, during pregnancy the use of long-acting reversible contraception after pregnancy, birth spacing. Birth spacing is quite important uh, because it is a risk factor for, um, uh, for future preterm birth. And then finally, for mental health, stress and depression, again, some data that I'll share with you in just a moment. Now, our group has found um, this whole array of positive outcomes. But I would be remiss if I didn't share with you, uh, if you will, some attenuated findings as well. And there were some meta-analyses and systematic reviews that found no difference in birth outcomes when the data were aggregated as one does in meta-analyses and systematic reviews. However, group care never resulted in worse outcomes. Secondly, there were noted improved outcomes for some populations, especially for high-risk women. And third, and I think very important, there are no adverse effects for group care. I can tell you in more than 15 years of research, never had to report uh, an adverse effect um, to an uh, institutional review board. Uh, we never had to stop a trial. Uh, nor did we have to um, you know, stop care. So I think that although uh, there's some attenuated effects, the overall uh, summary may be that group care results in outcomes that are as good or better than individual care. And in 2018, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists came out with an opinion paper, and they um, concluded that group prenatal care demonstrates high levels of patient satisfaction, that obstetric outcomes are, quote, equally efficacious as individual prenatal care. And again, uh, essentially quoting from these, the earlier work with improved outcomes for some populations. They suggest that group care can be offered as an alternative to individual prenatal care. They note some challenges to initiate and maintain, and I'm gonna talk about these at the end. And they also suggest that additional research is, is needed to demonstrate differences in outcomes and to identify populations who may benefit most. So let me in fact talk more in more detail about the research and about our findings. I know at the Institute and more broadly at the University of Glasgow, you're a, a sophisticated audience with, and uh, an interested audience with regard to methodology and particularly with regard to um, what I will call, you know, this continuum of evidence to action. And so I will provide some of the data from our studies, um, starting with the effectiveness trial to translation and then on to dissemination. And I am not going to describe a lot of the methodology because this work has been published over the years, um, but I will uh, take a moment to, to share with you that the first study was a randomized control trial at two academic medical centers in New Haven and Atlanta, um, Yale University and Emory University. And this was funded by the US National Institutes of Health and included 1,034 young women. Uh, based on the 
favorable outcomes from this study. We were funded again by the NIH to do a, a translational study. This was a cluster randomized control trial at 14 community health centers and hospitals in New York City. So I have here listed N equals 12, 1,233. That's the individual patients. But really, for a cluster randomized trial, the power is based on, uh, if you will, the N equals 14. That is the number of clinical sites. And what's important here is, of course, that we trained at these sites. Uh, and we were engaged, but we trained and then uh, the work was carried out, um, uh, you know, in the health centers and hospitals. And then finally, on the dissemination side, these are actually new results, not yet published. Uh, we've got to revise and resubmit. I was hoping to be able to share with you today that they were in press, but I will be able to share with you some new results from a dissemination study that is an effectiveness implementation hybrid design at four clinical sites in Detroit, Michigan, and Nashville, Tennessee, funded by the United Health Foundation with 2,402 patients. So in short, these are studies that were done in five US cities uh, and all of them, I will say, are what we would call high risk clinical sites. They're urban, um, uh, mostly uh, minority women and uh, low income and uh, publicly funded sites. So let's turn now to the very first outcomes. And these were published uh, in 2007 in, in uh, the Green Journal, Obstetrics and Gynecology. And here the pink bars are um, group, represent the women randomized to group prenatal care. And the blue bars represent those randomized to individual prenatal care. And for the total sample, you'll see that the rate of preterm birth was 13.9%. That is the blue bar uh, here on the left. And among those randomized to individual prenatal care, we reduced the risk of preterm birth by 33% to 9.8%. Among African Americans, where the base rate, baseline rates of preterm birth are higher, 15.9%, we had an even bigger effect with a reduction by 41%. Uh, to a preterm birth of 10.1. Now, I, this is an RCT, and I would like to draw your attention to the note at the bottom of the screen that indicates that the analyses all controlled for study site, and as well as for factors that were different by study condition despite randomization, which included race, prior preterm delivery, and prenatal distress. And then we also controlled uh, statistically for clinical factors that, uh, that we know affect outcomes, specifically smoking and prior miscarriage or stillbirth. So these effects were, were quite uh, profound. And I will show you one more slide from this study, which is the hazard function. And this is actually the time to prenatal birth. And so you can see that by the time we're at about week uh, 26 or 27 of gestation, we already see a differentiation uh, between individual care and group prenatal care. So uh, the, the solid line at the top is individual care and the dotted line at the bottom is group prenatal care. And so we see an effect for these very early preterm deliveries all the way through um, uh, you know, those coming uh, to 37 weeks. As I said, based on these findings, uh, I suppose based on, on these findings, we were funded by NIH once again to do a larger study, a translational study, this time a cluster randomized control trial. And this first slide is the intent to treat analyses. We, you can see the outcome here is slightly different. It's not preterm birth. It's rather a composite variable called small for gestational age. This is a combination of preterm birth together with birth weight. And so it's, it's um, an important and a, and a related outcome. And what you can see also is that our effect, in fact, was um, uh, the effect size was really quite similar. Uh, that is, uh, we had a baseline rate of uh, small for gestational age of 16% and a reduction to 11.8% and an odds ratio here of 0.66. So a 34% reduction here now in, the, in risk. 
And uh, again, remember this is a, a cluster RCT where we trained and then you know, we're a bit more hands off. So having said that, I'd like to acknowledge that it's real life and we had real adherence challenges. 22% of women at sites randomized to group prenatal care never attended any groups. And uh, the average number of group visits was 5.3 out of 10. So we see uh, you know, an average, uh, average adherence, if you will, of, of about 50%, of course, with a range of, of zero to 10 uh, group visits. So the next slide is in fact, uh, also published in the same paper in the American Journal of Public Health shows the as treated analysis. And here we're looking at those uh, who attended 50% or more of group visits versus those who attended less than 50%. And you can see the breadth and depth of, of our effects. We have impact on birth outcomes, the preterm birth and low birth weight, as well as small for gestational age. We have effects for neonatal outcomes, that is the APGAR score. This is a score of, of um, infant responsiveness uh, just after birth, as well as days in the neonatal intensive care unit. We had effects on prenatal knowledge and patient satisfaction, and then some of these reproductive health outcomes like rapid repeat pregnancy, as well as postpartum condom use. And uh, here, I think what is important, uh, as I said a moment ago, is, is the breadth of effect. Despite the fact that it is, as a, as a translational study, we trained uh, providers at the sites, and then as researchers were, were uh, you know, one step removed. Now, finally, in relation to birth outcomes, I'd like to share with you the, our new data. And here I have one, one method slide, uh, since these results are not yet published. And here we were working in uh, two cities, Detroit and Nashville, we had a total population of 3,759 women who had a live singleton birth and received at least one prenatal care visit at a participating study site during the study period. And of these, 22.5% uh, or 846 women received group prenatal care in our expect with me model and the remainder had individual care. Now, this was not a randomized trial, so we weren't randomizing to group versus individual care. Uh, people at the sites, providers at the sites, were trying to enroll women in group care, and 22.5% uh, of women agreed to participate in the study, knowing that they would get either group or individual care, and were able to attend uh, at the time that group for their month was being delivered. So as I mentioned earlier, perhaps they were due in August and their groups were on Thursday afternoons at 3 p.m. And you know, as such, they were able to attend. So we see that um, uh, nearly a quarter of women were um, given this opportunity to enroll in uh, group care. And I won't go through the details since they're here on the slide, uh, but we see based on the a priori exclusion criteria that we lost about a third of the women. There's no statistically significant difference overall or by the individual exclusion criterion. Uh, so we had a, a number of um, women who had a prior preterm birth who were excluded from analyses. They may have had missing data on prior preterm birth, entered prenatal care after 24 weeks gestation or were excluded because they never showed up for care at all. So in the end, we had 2,402 women, about 64% of women who delivered uh, during the study period. And again, you can see at the bottom here, one quarter receiving group care and three quarters receiving individual care. In the paper that is uh, currently um, uh, under revision uh, with a leading medical journal, we, I show uh, this figure that is uh, from the paper. And once again, you see a consistency of results, which to me is good in terms of validity and reliability. 
we had, we're again in these high risk urban settings. So we see rather high rates of preterm birth, 15%, but an extraordinary reduction to 6.4% in these high risk settings with a risk ratio of, of 0.42 as shown here. We also see uh, uh, an effect for low birth weight uh, from 11.6 to 4.3%. We had no statistically significant difference for small for gestational age. Um, I'm, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not really quite sure why, given that we had effects for both preterm birth and low birth weight, but when they were combined, we did not have uh, an effect here. Uh, but we did have an effect for NICU admission, again, with a reduction of uh, from 14.6 um, uh, to 9.4 percent and a risk ratio of, of 0.64. So these results, as were the, uh, the other ones, I would argue are not just statistically significant, but also clinically meaningful. Now, let me turn from birth outcomes to uh, several other sets of outcomes. And I want to focus for a moment on weight trajectories across pregnancy, because these are also uh, very important. So on the left here, you see what, what are the impacts of excess pregnancy weight gain for both mother and baby. And for mom, excess pregnancy weight gain results in gestational diabetes, or can result, excuse me, in gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and also increase the risk of cesarean section. For infants, they can result in macrosomia, that is being born too large for gestational age. This is an outcome that's often associated with gestational diabetes. Also fetal anomalies and even stillbirth. And then when we look at postpartum weight retention, for moms, this results in persistent obesity or can result in persistent obesity. And with that, chronic disease over the lifespan. You remember I, I mentioned earlier that these effects are not just restricted to the time, the perinatal time period, but can have long lasting effects. So analytically, what we wanted to do, what we did was we used the um, Institute of Medicine guidelines for weight gain during pregnancy, which are based on prenatal uh, uh, BMI or body mass index. And so these are just uh, on the right side are just the indicators of the recommended weight gain. And in analyses done by Bonnie Gould Rothberg from our team and others, we found, and this was uh, just based on data from uh, Yale University or Yale New Haven Hospital, we found some extraordinary outcomes we found that 78% of women exceeded gestational weight guidelines, weight gain guidelines, that 52% retained more than 10 pounds or 4.5 kilograms one year postpartum. And this again would be uh, in excess of the guidelines. And then we also noted that 69% actually shifted toward overweight or obese. So among women who were perhaps underweight, a very small number who were underweight or normal weight prior to pregnancy, became overweight or obese one year postpartum. And even those who were overweight shifted toward obese postpartum. Now I want to acknowledge that body mass index or BMI is an imperfect measurement, but it is, it is a good measure uh, for research and it is, um, it is an important indicator and one on which these clinical guidelines were based. So you might be thinking to yourself, what does this have to do with group prenatal care? Well, in this paper uh, published uh, or led by Urania Mogripolis, what we found was that women at sites randomized to group prenatal care. So in other words, this was the second randomized trial from um, uh, the New York study at 14 community health centers and hospitals they gained less weight during pregnancy and lost more weight postpartum. So let me um, draw your attention to the figure here. The vertical line, which is, in, uh, is meant to align with about 40 weeks, that is considered a full-term pregnancy. And so to the left of this line, we see uh, the 
uh, again, the dotted line, or the, the uh, which is the control condition or individual prenatal care, compared to the solid line, which is the intervention or group prenatal care. And you can see, again, starting in the third trimester at about 24 weeks or 26 weeks, um, that women are gaining less weight. And when we look to the right side of the vertical line, we see that they are losing more weight. And one year postpartum, we see that postpartum weight retention, the difference between group and individual prenatal care is greater than a stone. And I can only say that here with a UK audience. Uh, if I were if I were presenting in, in the US or elsewhere, I, I would say a, a difference of more than 15 pounds or more than seven and a half kilograms. So again, I would argue not just statistically significant, but very clinically meaningful. And keep in mind that in some ways, uh, or in many ways, group prenatal care was not designed specifically with an eye toward healthier weight, um, trajectories, though we do provide education and skills development for nutrition and physical activity. And so again, to me, the results are even more uh, profound. So I'll take a breath and now turn to my third outcome, and that is depression across the perinatal period. By now, hopefully these figures begin to look a little bit um, familiar. Here we have a solid, again, the solid line representing group care and the dotted line representing individual care. And this is uh, depressive symptoms uh, using the CESD score. And you can see that despite randomization, at baseline, there is a slight difference between uh, those in group versus individual care. But what is important here is that there's a significantly greater decline during pregnancy and most importantly, postpartum with quite a durable effect a year, six and, and especially 12 months postpartum. And uh, this paper and analyses was led by Jennifer Felder from University of California, San Francisco. And in addition to uh, this change over time, uh, we also found that depressive symptoms were significantly associated with birth outcomes. Specifically, we found that women who had an increase in depressive symptoms from the second to third trimester of pregnancy, and I should note that although the prior slide showed that an overall decline in depressive symptoms, that's of course an aggregated uh, on average for all women, there were some women who had an increase from the second to third trimester. Those women, along with those who had higher trimester three depressive symptoms, had shorter gestational age and were more likely to have a preterm birth, that is a delivery uh, before 37 weeks. And we didn't measure here, we didn't go past one year postpartum, so I put here uh, uh, speculative, but we would envision and we would expect long-term effects for mom and baby, as I described earlier. Both, I should say, both from the impact of um, chronic depression, as well as the impact of a shorter gestational age or preterm birth. Now, I hope that you're thinking to yourself, well, what are the potential mechanisms for these enhanced outcomes? So many different outcomes, favorable outcomes from group care. And I would argue that, of course, we're providing more knowledge and skills that they're, we're seeing, again, didn't present the data here, but we have documented change in healthier behaviors, health promoting behaviors, and a reduction in risky health behaviors, as well as changing norms. We see a decreased infection. I didn't present the data today, but uh, I mentioned in the earlier slide that we saw a difference in uh, sexually transmitted infections during and after pregnancy. And any infection during pregnancy can result in preterm birth. On the psychosocial side, we have documented greater group cohesion and social support and reduced stress and depression. 
And so on the bottom, I've illustrated sort of the biological mechanisms or a hypothetical set of biological mechanisms for these effects. Specifically, that social support is one of the things that is, resu that is um, uh, resulting in, in lower stress and depression, that this results in a more favorable endocrine milieu for mom and baby, that in turn, this healthier endocrine milieu sustains cervical length and therefore sustains the pregnancy longer. And just to be even more specific, an example is uh, stress, stress hormones, uh, we know literally result in shortened cervical length and preterm birth. And so we put this all together a bit hy hypothetically, if you will, for the mechanisms of these enhanced outcomes. Now, I'd like to um, highlight the work of Sir Jeffrey Rose. In the strategy of preventive medicine, he argues that a large number of people exposed to a small risk may generate many more cases, that is many more cases of disease than a small number exposed to a high risk. And for many years, I've, I've talked about the corollary to this uh, theorem, if you will. And that is a large number of people exposed to an intervention with even small effects may generate more positive health gains at the population level. And I, uh, to me, this is uh, one of the reasons why this body of work, not just from our research team, but from others, is so important. And so we might say, well, what is the low-hanging fruit? Therefore, what do you do with this uh, information? And I would maybe synthesize by saying that prevention efforts focused on high-risk populations those with comorbid medical conditions, including those who are overweight or obese, and uh, efforts focused on psychosocial factors during prenatal care and the interconception period, that is the post, you know, between pregnancies, could be or would be most effective. So I said in the beginning that I was going to talk a bit about cost. And here I'd like to begin with uh, some work from the National uh, Health Service in the UK. And in a, a, a paper that was actually originally published in 2019 with a progress report earlier this year, NHS said that reducing preterm birth is a priority for maternity and children's services. And they suggested establishing best practice pathways. Uh, they like alliteration as much as I do arguing for prediction, prevention, and preparation for preterm birth. What I think is particularly notable here is that they estimate the cost to the NHS of $3.4 billion per year. That is the cost of preterm birth, um, about 1.5% of the whole NHS uh, budget. And that by delaying gestation by just one week, that uh, NHS could save a billion pounds per year. Now, how, by what, by what uh, matters are these potential savings realized? Well, of course, there are primary savings, such as reductions in preterm birth and low birth weight, as well as um, utilization savings, the use of the emergency department and the neonatal intensive care unit. And then what I would call secondary savings, uh, again, of the type that I've already been discussing, like reduced infections, reduction in cesarean section and rapid repeat pregnancy, improvements in well baby care, and averted first and later year years of, med of life medical costs. And then uh, uh, one must always talk about the societal costs around preterm birth uh, and other adverse birth outcomes like emotional suffering, lost productivity, uh, special education for children due to the neurodevelopmental or cognitive delays, and, and many others. In a study done, uh, now I'm back to the United States, in a study done uh, specifically to explore return on investment, uh, Garo and colleagues in the state of South Carolina documented a similar outcome to our group, that is a 36% reduced risk of preterm birth and 28% reduced risk of neonatal intensive care unit stay. And they estimated 
uh, savings of $22,667 for each preterm birth averted. The state of South Carolina invested $1.7 million in this pilot project and over the five year period had $2.3 million returned. Uh, not bad, uh, I think, return on investment for a uh, clinical care intervention that again has immediate financial costs, but also health and societal costs for the long term. So in summary, we see that group prenatal care results in enhanced care, improved outcome, outcomes, plural, uh, reduced disparities. And here I'm referring to the effects, again, from our group and others that show more positive effects for even more positive effects for um, African-American women and those with at high risk due to other chronic conditions, health conditions and reduced costs. We sometimes refer to this as the quadruple aim. And in a, a paper that my colleagues and I published a couple of years ago, that in particular were highlighted transdisciplinary science. This was a paper that was part of a series of papers that was looking at transdisciplinary research, which I know many of you are interested in. And um, you know, here is again a, a summary or a synthesis of some of the advantages of care, of group care that I've just described uh, up to now, such as improved learning and skills, cultivation of social support. Uh, I think it's really important, the integration uh, of care to meet complex needs and, um, and so on. I will highlight at the bottom, um, something quite important at the organizational and institutional level, which I haven't really mentioned, and that is reduced repetition and uh, provider burnout by providing care in, in group settings. It is quite a change from uh, the individual care environment for both patients and for providers provides increased time uh, and, and therefore enhances both the quantity and the quality of care. And as I've just shared, uh, reduces costs. Now I said that uh, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists noted some challenges and solutions and, and we did too. You know, I've been involved in this for a long time. And there are challenges with regard, for instance, to group dynamics and concerns about confidentiality. But we create solutions by always having co-facilitators in the room. So there's always two providers, um, one who is the active facilitator and one providing some sort of the eyes and ears in the room and who can intervene if they're, if they're hearing something or, or if the primary provider has sort of missed something. We provide quite robust training so that uh, midwives, obstetricians, uh, primary care providers and ancillary care providers are, are ready to provide care in a group setting. When confidentiality is raised as a concern, I always say that group care is not for all patients nor all providers. It is voluntary. And of course, so is sharing anything in a group uh, that, that patients choose to share. At the outset, we establish ground rules and uh, trust and respect are paramount. There are difficult topics. For example, substance use or, or um, sexual or physical abuse that are raised by patients. And again, we rely on well-trained co-facilitators as well as peer sharing and support to help us address these topics. One thing that's really important is that these difficult topics often don't emerge in individual care, but when one patient in a group raises them, it provides an opportunity for all the women in the group to benefit. And then finally, the, the last two challenges that I'm highlighting here are more organizational, and this is resistant to change, resistance to change, and some operational issues like space, scheduling, and staff. Here, what we rely on for solutions are leadership and champions at the, at the leadership level, um, a chief of staff, a, a, a chief of medicine, a chief of obstetrics, but also champions can come from the patient population. And of course, we, we need the buy-in and the creative problem solving in order to address these challenges that 
always would incur, we would incur with any kind of innovation in clinical care. So what is, uh, I'd like to talk just for a moment about what's happened since. And here is some of, these are some of the places where um, Professor Fraser Burrell uh, will pick up in just a moment. Group prenatal care has been expanded into special populations of pregnant women across broad geographic regions and care domains. And so again, just uh, some examples here, which I, I won't repeat because they are listed on the slide, but certainly uh, in special populations of pregnant women, we see those at high risk, teens, refugees, uh, teens, comma, refugees, those in the military and those with chronic illness across geographic regions, the Americas, Africa, the EU, and the UK, and across many diverse care domains, which as I mentioned, Dr. Burrell will speak about in a moment. Um, and of course, here we'd be talking about not group prenatal care, but group health care or shared medical appointments. And uh, I think these are all really exciting areas uh, in clinical innovation and for future research. So, um, with regard to future research, I think it's important to determine how we can best support widespread adoption, implementation, and sustainability. I've shared with you some hypothetical mechanisms. It's important to test these and to look at the biological underpinnings. I think also it's very important to continue to confront health inequities and, um, and future research should be focused here. We want to continue to identify transformative innovations for patients, providers, health systems, and communities, as well as ways to leverage technology. And finally, I'd like to um, state explicitly the importance of evaluating virtual group care or telemedicine with regard to initiation, sustainability, and scale up. And uh, I hear of, uh, here, of course, on the bottom is an image of, of COVID. It seemed odd. Um, in August 2021 to not have any mention of this um, a pandemic. And so what we have seen is that virtual care, both individual and group care, has expanded phenomenally over the last 18 months. And I do hope that, in fact, it will, uh, can and will be sustained. So in closing, I want to acknowledge and, and thank, of course, um, my many, many collaborators over the years. I'd like to highlight especially Jessica Lewis, with whom I've worked with uh, for more than 25 years, from when she was um, a young uh, college grad uh, to now that she is on the faculty at Yale. And one of my newer collaborators, um, uh, Fraser Burrell from Newcastle, as well as my funders from NIH, United Health, and uh, Health Research and Services Administration. And I'd like to thank, of course, all of you uh, at the University of Glasgow and at the Institute of Health and Wellbeing. Uh, thank you again for the honor of delivering the Maurice Block Lecture. And like you at the Institute, uh, my research team and I strive to understand and promote population health. I think we have a shared approach and shared ethos as we strive to understand the determinants um, identify solutions and use data to drive change. Or stated another way, uh, how we bring evidence to action. And I'd like to close with, I think, the uh, eloquent words of Abu Bakr from the sixth century, who says, without knowledge, action is useless, and knowledge without action is futile. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And I will turn it over to Dr. Burrell. Thanks, Jeanette. I've, uh, I've tried to answer the questions um, that have been asked, quite insightful questions, but, but I'll, let add, I'll let Jeanette also add her own thoughts. So just to, to generalize this, obviously, even those of you who aren't working in antenatal care um, are parents, grandparents, uh, you have extended families. But, but once you've seen one model of care, as I think Jeanette's program of research has shown very nicely, it then becomes easier to do the next step. So she's shown us 
a coherent pad program of research from effectiveness translation to dissemination. But actually, once you've proven something works in a whole system, it's much easier to apply it to different systems. So I'm just highlighting on this first slide, uh, as well as my affiliations, I'm highlighting our collaborators, Group Consultations Limited, who are a co-applicant for the Sir Jules Thorne Trust grant. Um, and this highlights the, the key aspects of lifestyle medicine, which Jeanette has been highlighting within each of her individual studies, eating well, um, you know, doing the right amount of exercise, not smoking, uh, sleeping well, having good relationships and responding well in terms of managing stress. These are the key aspects of lifestyle medicine, those six pillars, and it's a rapidly growing movement. So the BSLM now has over 1900 members and we are meeting in Edinburgh, second to the 4th of September, you know, which I hope you'll consider coming. My own historical perspective, I would highlight that as well as Sir Maurice Bloch, uh, who arrived in Glasgow in 1910, his contemporary, um, Joseph Pratt, was working at Massachusetts General in 1905. He did the first group care. He called it the class method. He did it for people who were too poor or who couldn't get into TB sanatoria. And um, so he's using it to manage TB. This worked rather well. He published it in 1907 in, in JAMA. And then it, it spread to all kinds of chronic disease uh, and was actually the forerunner for group psychotherapy, which obviously is still established today. Uh, so his whole career was published um, in a conference proceeding in New, New England Journal in 1955. So, so these contemporaries were addressing the same problems in different ways and different sides of the Atlantic. Jeanette's already alluded to the quadruple aim of healthcare. That's better experience, better outcomes, uh, better experience for staff and lower cost. But we would suggest that also because it delivers better education to both patients and to trainees, both undergraduates and postgraduates, um, we, we might even call it the quintuple aim of, of healthcare education. And there is evidence across the whole life course. Obviously, um, you know, we've heard fantastic depth um, and insights into how this can happen for prenatal care. But there's corresponding evidence in, in childhood through adults and it can even be successfully used for uh, multi-morbidity in the elderly. So, so the key thing is that there is evidence showing this is generalizable in the same way that Jeanette has shown it can be effective across the whole healthcare system for prenatal care. Um, I've already put in answer to one of the questions, our, our key publication, the Future Healthcare Journal, and that talks about a systems approach to embedding group clinics and, and virtual group consultations, which really maps directly to the the ecological systems theory, which uh, Jeanette has used to explain, you know, why we do this type of research. The key thing is the efficiency. So if you're getting the same or better outcomes, but you can see more people with less clinician time, you know, in the current post pandemic, pandemic environment where waiting lists have gone through the roof, we don't have any other things which can be implemented next week uh, to address you know, the healthcare needs of the population, and this delivers, you know, up to 400% efficiency. So it's better access for everybody, even if you don't choose to attend the groups. Long term, we found 40% of people in Anik and Berwick attended our groups, uh, but that meant we had shorter waiting lists. So the benefits were seen even for the people who didn't choose, in, choose to uh, elect to choose group care. I'll let you read through the, you know, what people say in terms of their group consultation experience. These are real people giving us feedback about uh, their diabetes experience in groups. And then similarly, we're using them across a whole wide range of conditions in the UK and elsewhere. And that includes long COVID and long-term conditions, but I draw attention to pregnancy circles at the lower right corner. This is Angela Harden's work in the University of East London. She's now moved to City University, where she's shown that these pregnancy models do work in the UK, even in the most deprived and multi-ethnic populations where all kinds of difficult things are, are addressed and we see there very similar outcomes. Although there's a limited amount of evidence for virtual groups, it's powerful bridging evidence. Um, and if you link into the paper that I've alluded to, uh, provide the link for, you'll see key, key link of evidence from Shibuya, which looked at bariatric surgery uh, with virtual groups. And of course, uh, the, the other key publication was it was in diabetes, um, looking to Kuda et al. Uh, in 2016, which showed all the same improvements you'd expect to see. And this was virtual groups delivered in uh, Guam from a, a, a nurse in Hawaii, 3,000 miles away, 
and a pharmacist who was 8,000 miles away in Rhode Island. So actually the, the space and the distance becomes irrelevant. So, so, you know, you couldn't imagine a more challenging uh, proof of concept study than, than, than showing that you, you can achieve all those outcomes. Is this relevant to Scotland? Well, it is because it maps very strongly to, to realistic medicine, to house of care and the modern outpatient programme. Um, and what we see is that they're gaining momentum virtual groups and these are the reasons why. So what I would suggest is, you know, join us and, uh, you know, link into the website that, that I've highlighted here. If you want to download the group consultation app, clinicians who are delivering care and want to live, deliver more care at the same with better outcomes, uh, you can do this. If you want to contribute and join uh, as, a re as a center for our, our national uh, group consultations evaluation study, which now has adoption for the network, as well as ethical approval, then please do feel free to email me. And obviously in Scotland, there's quite a few clinicians already doing this, but what we don't have at the moment is the whole system push. We did have discussions with the Chief Medical Officer's Office before pandemic, but actually this is the ideal time for us to move and we're, we're hoping that the, this will provide a big push Jeanette's Jean, talk in Glasgow. So I'll just leave you with these key take home messages. I don't think I, you know, anybody could have explained this more eloquently and shown the depth of evidence underpinning this than Jeanette. Um, and I'm not gonna read out my slide, but you can see those key take home messages. Um, and please do come to the meeting um, in the Edinburgh International Convention Centre. Jeanette Fraser, thank you very much indeed. Um, a really interesting, fascinating presentation, Jeanette. Um, I, I said that you, you very clearly made an impact in this area. Uh, you, you certainly have. Uh, and Fraser, thank you for that very considered discussion, bringing many of these issues back to uh, back to our home shores. I'm conscious that we've gone a little bit over the official time, but I, I do also note that we've got a we've got a few of our participants who are able to stay on with us. I think I shared with you, Jeanette and Fraser, that we've got a parallel conference unit conference happening today, so we, we've lost a bit of our audience, but. If it's acceptable to the two of you, we have had a couple of questions through the Q&A. Uh, Fraser, I know you've already uh, typed a couple of answers, but I thought if we've got a couple of minutes, we could maybe take those questions and, and then close. So the first question um, comes from Professor Danny Wright. I don't know if Danny's still with us. Um, <clears throat> thank you for a really interesting presentation. If possible, mechanisms include change social norms and social support. Is it worth studying whether the intervention would be more effective delivered to existing social groups rather than newly formed groups? So Fraser, I know you've put some initial thoughts to that, but could I maybe open it up maybe to yourself for your thoughts on that one, Jeanette, and then we can maybe hand over to Fraser. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And apologies for running a bit long, um, but I'm, I'm fine to stay. Uh, I think uh, it's an interesting question. Um, what my gut response is, you know, it, it's all good, you know, existing groups or that is existing social networks or newer ones. I think there are two things that favor the newer and that is number one we are looking and we do bring people together in the same the same gestational age and so in an existing network it would be quite rare for eight or ten or twelve women to all have a pregnancy at exactly the same time so there's there's a bit of that practicality and then I suppose um, from a both a social perspective and then from a research slash measurement perspective, you know, we would have greater opportunity to see these increases in social support that I think would carry forward in terms of the health outcomes. So while I would not uh, restrict to existing social networks, I think we might get, if you will, a bit more bang for buck by actually adding um, more depth and scope to those social networks, that is adding more women uh, and, and families going through pregnancy concurrently. Great. Peter, did you want to add anything to that? The only thing that I would add is that um, Kamalini Randus from London Business School, who did the editorial with Ara Darzi in uh, 2017 on this topic, you know, she, she thinks that this type of group can work for businesses as well. So, so it isn't just a healthcare model, 
it, it's certainly something that can lead to effective change whichever setting you want so so that that would be the kind of broader context and and it could be driven by businesses as well as by by healthcare providers and and first you've just reminded me of one thing that i'll mention um if for those who are interested and that is the work by social psychologist uh, tuckman and colleagues on group uh forming and a uh, group you know, he says uh, they form, they norm norm norm. Norm. <laughs> yes, they, uh, you know, they storm, they form, they storm, they norm and they adjourn. So uh, I think that's that's uh, in part of that business context. Uh, and for those interested, I'm happy to share that citation. Great. Um, so one last question then, and this comes from Vicky Ferguson, one of my colleagues in the unit again. So this is a question around South Saharan African population. So has any of this work been, um, if you like, implemented in the low and middle income country setting and, and, and how effective was it? And, and, and maybe what are some of the, the considerations if we do have experience in that setting about taking this model there? Yeah, it's a good question, Becky. And there's, um, uh, uh, you know, a whole talk could be done, of course, just on that. Um, the, let me start with the very biggest challenge, and that is the amount of prenatal care that is typically offered in those settings in sub-Saharan Africa. Women are often coming from uh, uh, far sites, perhaps from rural settings into urban settings in order to get prenatal care, or even if they're in urban, urban settings. And so a typical number of visit, prenatal visits, and in fact, those um, uh, recommended from WHO, I think it's just four or five. And so as if we have any adherence fall off, just the opportunity to establish and sustain the groups is challenging. Um, the, I believe the most recent, so it has been used in Sub-Saharan Africa, and I believe the very, the most recent study published earlier this year is from Dillis Walker, is the lead author, and uh, uh, from UCSF Preterm Birth Initiative in Rwanda, and they, they found no difference. But what was interesting about their study and about their population was they had a very, very low, I've, I've talked to Dillis about this, they had a very low risk population. So despite it being Rwanda, um, somehow uh, through their clinical sites, and it was quite a large study, they, uh, their baseline preterm birth rates and, and other adverse outcomes were quite low. And so they didn't see any um, statistically significant gain from group care. But again, neither was it worse, nor were there adverse outcomes. So I think in higher risk populations with dedicated personnel, um, that this absolutely can be applied in those uh, lower resource settings. And in fact, I would think that they would be uh, even better. We certainly, uh, Fraser, as Fraser mentioned, in uh, the UK and, and the work that we've done in the US, we've been working in these more low resource settings, though it's not Sub-Saharan Africa, of course. The only comment I would add to that is that um, the, the other kind of resource poor areas have produced some pretty powerful evidence. So for example, Yongling uh, was a Chinese rural population study with over a thousand patients mm. which showed greater efficacy for hypertension. Um, obviously, Kamalini Ramdas, they've completed their RCT in, uh, in India uh, in the Arvind Eye Hospital as well, but that hasn't been published yet. But, but again, what you see is, you know, as, as Jeanette's data showed very nicely, you know, the greater the inequality, the greater the capacity to see improvements with this kind of intervention, which is so efficient. Great. Well, look, folks, I'm sure we could continue to discuss this topic for a good couple of hours, but time is not our friend. So I'm, I'm going to close um, and begin to close, if I may. So I think it really just remains to thank you both for your presentations today. I, as I say, I, I've learned so much listening to your presentations. I had the, the advantage of hearing a pre-presentation from you both, so I've had a bit of time to think about it. And I'll certainly be in touch in some of the work that I do um, around heart failure and taking interventions to patients. I, I think we can certainly benefit from this approach. Um, Fraser, we look forward to welcoming you to Scotland next week. All the very best with your conference in Edinburgh. I hope the British yeah. Society of Lifestyle Medicine conference goes well and that uh, your plug for the conference has stimulated a couple of our folks in Glasgow to come over to uh, the other side 
um, and, uh, and, and join you. Uh, Jeanette, we would very much love to have you come to Glasgow. We weren't able to do it this time, as you say, with COVID, but that welcome is always there for you. Please do take advantage of it. That, that Glasgow welcome, our hospitality um, awaits you. But in the meantime, there will be winging its way over the pond, as they say, uh, just a small token of our huge thanks for taking on the 2021, I think I said 2020, don't know quite where I was at the start of my presentation, the 2021 Morris Block Lecture. We really enjoyed your presentation. And again, huge thanks for your time in preparing it. Thank you. It's been a real honor and privilege and wonderful opportunity to get to know you a bit, Rod and, and Audrey. And I look forward to, um, as you say, hopefully uh, convening in person in the coming years. Thanks very Thank much. You. Take Thank care. You. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Audrey.